Hi everyone. This is a screencast of a talk I recently gave at that conference 2016 called ReactJS for Beginners. Before we dive into the content, I'd like to thank the organizers of that conference for putting on such a great event this year. My family and I had a really great time at the conference this year, and we can't wait to come again next year. Let me also take a moment to thank the sponsors from that conference, because without their support, that conference would never have happened. My name is Art. I'm a senior software engineer living in the Chicago suburbs. If you want to learn more about me, you can visit my website, akawebdesign.com, and follow me on Twitter. When I spoke at that conference, I asked everyone in the audience if they loved JavaScript. Not everyone raised their hand, and that's not surprising given some of the quirks JavaScript is well known for. So I rephrased the question to ask, how many people use Stack Overflow? Nearly everyone's hand in the audience went up. One of the things I love most about Stack Overflow is that they put out a developer survey every January cataloging what happened on their site during the previous calendar year. In January of this year, 2016, they put out that same survey cataloging what happened during calendar year 2015, in which they made one thing abundantly clear, that JavaScript is no longer an optional skill for developers. Here's a few of the stats that we encountered. Namely, that JavaScript is among the most popular technologies on Stack Overflow, and it's certainly one of the most desired skills in today's job market. Stack Overflow noted that more people use JavaScript than any other programming language on the site. The news got even better for people interested in React. Not only is React a subset of the JavaScript demographic, but React is among the top paying tiers for JavaScript developers and developers at large. Perhaps more importantly, it's among the most loved tech on the site. And you can see on the chart on the right just how popular it was in 2015. Well, the moral of the story is clearly that everyone needs to be like Scrooge McDuck. Learn JavaScript, learn React, and swim in our large piles of money. Except that in 2016, Learning JavaScript and the ecosystem around React and some of the other frameworks that you might decide to use is really a painful experience. I'm hoping that my talk today can alleviate some of those fears and get you started down the right path. Because ultimately you need JavaScript. As a bonus, you might really like React. So let's talk about learning the JavaScript ecosystem today in 2016 talk about how React fits into that ecosystem, and we'll walk away being more informed, more productive, and hopefully more profitable developers as we can utilize those skills at our current jobs or go out and find a new job. So let's dive right into React. React is a JavaScript library built by Facebook for building user interfaces. Typically, when you go to a conference, or you watch videos like this on YouTube, or you read about React on any number of blogs online, you will frequently hear about three things. First would be components. The second would be the virtual DOM. And the third would be data flow, specifically the flux pattern. In today's presentation, I'm only going to be talking about components. The virtual DOM and Flux are certainly important concepts to understand about React, but they're not required for getting started and building your first React application. The purpose of React is simply building user interfaces. And in fact, Facebook said they built React to solve one problem, that they had a large application with data that changed over time. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like pretty much every web application I've ever built. Based on that definition alone, React certainly sounds like an option we should check out. When learning React, it's important to understand how components work in order to build a larger application. Components can be thought of like Lego blocks, meaning they are smaller parts of the application that can be pieced together 
to build something much larger and more complicated. React is all about components. They're encapsulated, and they can be reused throughout the application. Some people choose to think of React as the V in MVC, or the view in the model view controller pattern. This is somewhat misleading, because React isn't truly an MVC-style framework. In fact, React doesn't care about the models or the controllers that you might use in that pattern. And in fact, other patterns people typically use with React don't involve MVC at all. However, the point stands that React is only here to build user interface components, which would be what we typically think of as the view in MVC. Components in React are simple and declarative. They are intended to be small and direct in what they accomplish. In fact, components only really care about two things. First would be the properties that were declared when using this component somewhere in the application. And second would be their own internal state. Here's a simple example of a React component. It's pretty straightforward looking at the code what this component does. It has a render function, which returns a DOM element, inside of which is some text, as well as an injected property. So on the last line, we can see we're using the hello message component and assigning the name John. You can imagine what the output of this component would be, simply a div element inside of which is the text, Hello John. It's important to note that the code on the screen is in fact this JSX syntax, which we'll talk about more in a moment. It looks a lot like JavaScript, but it has some important differences that we'll need to cover. The takeaway is that components in React are simple and declarative, just like this example. Now every component in React has a life cycle. Throughout the lifetime of a component, certain events will fire that allow us to manage the internal state and the display of that component. Some events only happen once, namely when a component is first initialized or when a component is destroyed. And we can see some of these events listed on the screen here. In the column on the left, we'll see some events that only happen the first time a component is mounted to the screen, meaning the first time that component is added to the DOM. As an example, we might want to add an event listener to the window when the component first mounts. And similarly, when we remove that component from the DOM in the destruction phase, we should probably remove that event listener from the window to avoid memory leaks or runtime errors. In the middle column, we'll see that there's a recurring update phase for every component. So anytime that the properties or the internal state of the component change, the component will re-render itself. This is important to realize because it's different from other JavaScript frameworks that involve concepts like two-way data binding. And React is really built for performance, so it gives you the ability to control how and when a component re-renders. Just a moment ago, I mentioned the concept of JSX, which is an extension of JavaScript built by Facebook that allows for simple and declarative coding. JSX is optional for building React applications. It's not required, but it is certainly something that I would recommend to build your React applications. To illustrate that point, let's look at an example. Using traditional ES5 code, this is how you would create a React component. We can see that we're creating a hello message component, but the render function is a bit confusing. We are returning the result of react.create element, which is similar to the document.create element API. And if you've ever used that, you'll know just how confusing this can be. 
In this example, we're creating a div, and for some reason we have to pass null as the second argument. Heaven forbid we forget to pass that value, because debugging this will be very, very difficult. By contrast, we can look at using JSX, in which it's very clear what's happening. We're returning a div element with hello and then the name of the property that was provided to the component. There's no create element API because React handles that under the hood. I think we all can agree that JSX is more simple and declarative over vanilla ES5. To take one more step in that direction, we can incorporate ES2015 to the mix, where we can begin using ES2015 classes to extend a React component. Comparing that to the previous code, which was simply JSX, you can see that not much of the code changes, but it does become slightly more declarative that we're creating a class extending React component. As we move forward throughout the rest of this presentation, I will fully encourage us to use both JSX and ES2015. So let's stop for a moment and talk about the state of JavaScript in 2016. As I mentioned in my opening statement, the ecosystem of JavaScript today is more confusing than it's ever been. Part of that has to do with where dependencies are, if you're pulling them down from the Node Package Manager. Some of it has to do with the diverging support for ES2015, which includes the latest updates to the JavaScript language. If you're using one of the modern browsers, like the latest versions of Chrome, Opera, and Firefox, or if you're writing Node.js code, you can use Node.js 6, and all of these environments give you great support for ES2015. Safari 10 Beta promises to support every feature in ES2015, but not all of our users are guaranteed to be using the latest and greatest browser. However, as developers, it's important to start using ES2015 because it's going to make our lives easier. It's going to offer us syntactic sugar like import statements and classes, the ability to use template strings. ES2015 introduces block scoping and true constant variables, as well as arrow functions, which help us to preserve scope as we write functions. One takeaway here is that all of your existing ES5 code will still work. There's no need to have a knee-jerk reaction to learning all of the new things in ES2015. You don't have to start using them all at once. In fact, you can just start using them where it makes the most sense. Learning ES2015 will take a bit of practice and a little bit of time to become comfortable. And that's okay, but ES2015 support is here, and it's only going to improve with time. If you're anything like me, you probably spend a lot of time on Stack Overflow trying to find answers to your questions. And this will never be more true than when trying to start learning React, JSX, and ES2015. Stack Overflow is a fantastic place to get answers to your questions because lots of other people just like you have the same questions and encounter the same problems. When I first started learning React, I thought to myself, I'm the kind of person who learns by doing. What's a small project that I can build to help me learn React and ES2015 all at the same time? Well, I came up with the idea of building a Google Chrome extension to tell me when I had inbox notifications from Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is certainly a great place to find your answers, but if you're not stalking the site for a notification, they won't email you until three hours after the fact. Perhaps I'm a little impatient, so I wanted to be notified instantly if I had a response to one of my questions. You can view the code for my project on GitHub. It's built using React with JSX and ES2015. And it's available in the Chrome Web Store for free if you want to install it and use it yourself. 
there's a few other pieces to the JavaScript ecosystem that my example uses as well, namely Babel and Grunt. We're not going to worry about those two pieces for the discussion today, but the final product is only 73 kilobytes when you go to install it in Chrome. This speaks somewhat to the amazing code that I've written, but really it speaks to the reasons why React is so performant. It's just a small library for building user interfaces. Now, my React application is very simple. I create a div element with an ID of content, into which I render my application. My application only consists of two components. The first is a message list, which can have any number of children of the type message. And you can see here on the left what my application looks like inside of Google Chrome. This is a simple application, but it's no more complicated than any other React application you'll ever have to build. When we look at the code on GitHub, we're going to start in the index.js file, which is the launching point for any React application. You can see we're using ES2015 and importing my message list component from a different file. We then render my message list component to an existing DOM element with an ID of content. When you look at the HTML for this file, you'll see that div element right here. Next, we can explore the message list component. The message list is a class that extends React component. In its constructor, we're going to set some initial state for this component, specifically setting an empty array of data and a null value for the user ID. We set this initial state because when the component first renders, we don't know if the user has actually logged in to Stack Overflow. And clearly, if they haven't logged in, we can't have any notifications to pull from their API. I'm going to jump ahead to the render method of this component to explain its output before I explain how we get the data. Let's start at the bottom where we return a div element. You can see here, using JSX, it's very simple and declarative that we're returning a div element with a certain class name. And we're injecting some messages directly inside of that div. Beneath that, there's another div in which we're going to inject a link to the user's profile. So let's see how we build the messages. At the top of the render function, we'll see we're creating a messages variable that defaults to a paragraph tag with some empty text. Further down, we're going to check to see if the internal state of this component has any data. And if it does, we'll loop over that data using the array.map method which will loop through every message in that array, creating a message component, assigning a title, a URL, a date, and a type for each message. So by the time we get back down to the return statement, we know that messages is either going to be a paragraph tag, its default value, or it's going to be an array of message components. Similarly, this Stack Overflow link variable is going to default to an anchor tag that simply says open Stack Overflow. But if the user has already logged in, we can swap that for an anchor tag in which we display the user's profile picture and link directly to their profile. The message component in this application is even simpler. It consists solely of a return statement in which we have several div elements in which we inject properties that have been assigned to this component. For example here, we're taking the date provided by the Stack Overflow API, which comes as a Unix time. We multiply it by a thousand, 
so that we can have a true JavaScript date object. And we format that as a UTC string. And finally, we take the URL that was given to us by the Stack Overflow API, and we inject that, as well as the title, into a link so that the user can click directly on that title and take them to the page from which that notification came. The final product is a simple React application, and I encourage you to check out my source code so you can become more familiar with it, and even fork it if you'd like. Now, just a few days ago, the React team created a new utility called Create React App, which helped to reduce the learning curve and the setup time for creating a new React application. You can read this post on the React website, creating apps with no configuration, which they walk you through the steps of using this NPM utility. This tool is great for beginners because it prevents you from having to futz with the Webpack and the Babel configurations by hand, which historically were troublesome for developers new to the React and the JavaScript ecosystem. You simply run one command to get up and running and create your boilerplate code for a React app. The Create React App boilerplate code essentially has three parts. The first is using npm to get all of the dependencies your application would need. Specifically, it pulls down these two constructs called Babel and Webpack, which are part of the greater JavaScript ecosystem. Babel helps to translate our JSX and ES2015 code, which can only be read by modern browsers into legacy ES5 code, which can be read by any browser, and Webpack, which bundles all of our code into a single production file, so we reduce the amount of resources our application needs at runtime. Create React App prevents us from having to do all of this by hand, and as I said, it lowers the learning curve for developers new to the JavaScript and React ecosystems. You don't have to configure these things manually, but it's important to know that they're there under the hood. If you're new to React or new to JavaScript in general, learning React and JavaScript in 2016 can certainly be overwhelming. As we just covered, there's a lot of things to consider between learning JSX, ES2015, Babel, Webpack, Create React App, and a variety of other things you might want to put into your own applications. Having said that, you don't need to be scared, because there are tools and resources that allow you to get up and running quickly, simply taking the time to learn what this ecosystem offers will make you a more informed and more productive developer at your own job. My hope is that you can translate the knowledge you've learned in this presentation into becoming more profitable where you currently are or when you decide to go out into the world looking for a new job. You need JavaScript, and if you really like working with React, you're going to be set up for a lot of success. There was a lot of really good discussion at the end of my conference session, and we did some live coding as well. Since it's hard to do that in a YouTube video, I would simply encourage you to reach out to me personally via my website, akawebdesign.com, or follow me on Twitter at Arthur A. K. Maybe I'll even see you next year at that conference 2017. Thanks for watching.